Yeah, so I, um, I'll talk about uh, normal hearing very briefly to remind you of your medical school days. Um, hearing loss, um, just presentation, uh, assessment and treatment, and then have a little case report at the end of this. Um, so normal hearing obviously involves the pinna in the ear canal as well, but the um, sort of crucial thing is the tympanic membrane where we uh, sort of really amplify sound from the air conduction part of uh, hearing to the um, fluid containing um, uh, compartments of the cochlea. So um, here the uh, eardrum is very important transmitting from a large surface area to a smaller surface area um, as well as the uh, leverage system of the ossicular chain to a smaller degree. The sound gets transmitted via the stapes to the fluids of the inner ear. Um, vibrations of those fluids result in um, frequency specific uh, stimulation of the hair cells and then you get the ele electrochemical transmission via the cochlear nerve up the pathway to the um, hearing cortex. And that pathway sort of crosses over so it um, involves both uh, cortices. That's all about anatomy you need to know. Now, I will talk about acute hearing loss. So what um, are we talking about? So I want to keep it quite practical. So I want, to, I want you to imagine so the patients you might have seen who arrived in your practice. And they, they don't present with hearing loss. They don't say um, necessarily, look, I've got a hearing loss. They present with a blocked ear, with pressure in the ear, with a numb feeling sometimes. And it's not uncommon. And uh, you examine the patient, obviously, hopefully, and you look at the ear, and it all looks completely normal. <laughs> Okay, but you need to be careful. And unfortunately, I'm sort of damaged goods because I've seen a lot of um, uh, bad things happen uh, with people presenting with hearing loss. So I want to start with some exclusions, which luckily are rare, and many of uh, you will not see them, but you need to be aware of them and need to exclude them when you see these patients. Um, so be aware of associated symptoms. So in particular, you know, if there's tinnitus and vertigo, that's reasonably common with hearing loss, but if there are other neurological symptoms and signs, uh, in particular if there's a sort of altered, um, uh, altered um, level of consciousness, and in particular if there's, acute, um, if there's associated acute or chronic infection. This is a patient who presented with hearing loss, sudden hearing loss, uh, but also had a background history of chronic ear discharge. This is a cholesteatoma, and this is the brain abscess that went with it. And so, and if you're a careful observer, this is the left ear, there's a brain abscess in the right. So this hematogenous spread um, of an abscess to the brain with associated um, edema. Uh, neurological exams are also important because, as you hopefully know, a sudden hearing loss or a unilateral hearing loss can be associated with uh, tumors of the um, posterior lateral skull base. Uh, this is acoustic neuroma. Um, uh, so it's, it's an MRI scan, left ear, right ear, um, normal on the left. On the right hand side you see this big, big lump that pushes the brain stem to the side. Uh, this is a tumor that is too, uh, too large to observe, uh, which required surgery. Also be aware of sort of simple things. You know, the patient might be on medications. You might have started some Voltaren recently or some other uh, anti-inflammatories and by stopping them, the hearing loss can improve. It's a sort of temporary loss. But also chemotherapeutic agents can result in unilateral hearing loss. Uh, aminoglycosides are well known to cause hearing loss. In particular, the topical antibiotics, most of them contain aminoglycosides and some patients just keep on pouring them into the ear with perforations and grommets and that can result in hearing loss. We've implanted patients who have applied sofidex to both ears for months. And be aware of patients who present after trauma, even minor trauma. They might have been diving, jumping into a pool with some ear pressure resulting in hearing loss. Um, might have poked something into their ear, might have been on a flight uh, equalizing frequently. Um, and if you don't ask for that, they might not volunteer that, but if you push on the ear, that might result in a vertigo and it might result in nystagmus at the same time. So you need to uh, look for that. So a fistula test is simply where you push on the tragus um, and cause some sort of increase and decrease in pressure of pressure in the a middle ear and that might result in symptoms in this patient and I mention all of these because these need discussions with the acute team uh, at Auckland Hospital. Next you need to consider um, 
working out whether this patient has a conductive hearing loss or sensorineural hearing loss. Um, this is a bad drawing, but it works. Um, this is the ear canal, eardrum, middle ear with ossicles. If anything goes wrong there, you get a conductive loss. If there's a hearing loss due to pathology if of the cochlea or the pathway beyond, you end up with a sensory neuro hearing loss. Actually, I need a volunteer, Subesh. Um, so let's assume he's got a right-sided hearing loss. The first thing you can easily do in your, in your general practice is assuming you do a clinical test of hearing. So this is your masking device. You need to mask the other side out and just scratch on that ear. It's a simple test. It's not totally reliable. And you can then present sounds. Okay, so if you whisper from about 30 centimeters from behind so the patient can't see your um, lips, um, the patient should hear that if the hearing is normal. If you have to speak with a normal voice for the patient to hear, the, pa the, the hearing is reduced to about 30, 40 decibels. If you have to speak loudly, it's even worse, you've got a severe loss. If you have to shout, you really have a problem. Well done. <laughs> nice skin, nice skin. <laughs> Next we have the test you all know. You're all familiar with the um, tuning fork testing. Um, I've got a patient here who's got middle ear pathology. Uh, this is one of my colleagues who used to be a registrar once. And um, she performed a Weber test here, and the patient said she could hear it on the right-hand side. So she's got poor hearing on the right-hand side. The tuning fork is here. She can hear it louder on the right-hand side. What kind of hearing loss is that? Conductive hearing loss. And we check that with the now Weber back. test. And front or behind, okay? Okay, so that's the right-hand side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she could hear it louder behind. The, the performance of the test wasn't very good, but the result is all right. Okay, so, <laughs> so we would have to fail her on this, I think. <laughs> Tell her that, yeah. <laughs> so she, so she, uh, this girl had a, a conductive hearing loss, but um, so what I want to do is now sort of forget about all the red, red flags. Let's go back to our normal scenario. So you, done your ear examination, you've done your clinical test of hearing, you've done the tuning fork testing, and you've got a sensory neural hearing loss. So what is next? So what tests should you order? And obviously you want to confirm your hearing loss, and so the first thing you need to ask is a diagnostic hearing, um, audiogram. Um, now there are lots of audiologists out there, there's a lot of competition, and a lot of them distribute little uh, sort of tickets so you can get, uh, give them to your patients who can't afford it to get a diagnostic audiogram, and a diagnostic audiogram is the only audiogram that will tell you whether it's a conductive or an inner ear sensory neural hearing loss. There are lots of audiologists out there who obviously want to have business and do screening audiograms. They will not help you, they will not give you that information. They can be useful in some uh, situations, but for this purpose, they're not good. Once you've confirmed the hearing, it's like the, in this patient, this is a, the right ear, this is the left ear. Normal hearing is above 15 decibels. So you can see that there. This patient has a very mild hearing loss. In fact, this patient presented a few times. Initially, it wasn't too bad. The hearing got a bit worse and it was a bit blocked. And ultimately, there was that um, audiogram. In, even with this, the ENT surgeon said, well, shall we or shall we not? This patient had an MRI scan and this is the patient who had that tumor that I just showed, okay? So just because there's a mild hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss, doesn't mean uh, the chances of a tumor are lower or that if there's a tumor, it's smaller. Uh, it's not a good predictor. Blood tests, we used to do a whole battery of blood tests, we stopped. You know, unless you've got clinical suspicions of something else going on, if there's a bilateral hearing loss, you know, if you think there's an autoimmune cause, uh, if you're concerned about anything else, do a blood test, but overall, blood tests don't help much. And then you need the audiogram to start treatment. Obviously, you want to discuss the sensory neural hearing loss or refer the patient to the ENT department once you've determined a sensory neural hearing loss, uh, but you commence treatment uh, with prednisone. And then you refer to the ENT service, and we would normally do a virtual referral where we arrange an MRI scan in public um, and then decide what to do once we've seen the results. Um, this is a sort of uh, example of a real patient, 45-year-old physiotherapist who um, had a left blocked ear and presented to an after-hour clinic. Everything else was completely normal. There was some cerumen, the um, doctor said, and um, 
um, sort of thought, well, maybe it's a, 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 eustachian, a bit of a eustachian tube dysfunction because of the cold you'd had earlier. Also, maybe it's from the obstruction of the cerumen. I think, as a general rule, if you see a bit of earwax in the ear canal, most likely it will not cause any hearing loss. Okay, So don't worry about a bit of wax unless they've got completely blocked ears and sort of have a history of that. It's highly unlikely. The other thing that's important here, the there was no clinical test of hearing done and no tuning fork testing done. And had that been done, then you, you, uh, what, what kind of hearing loss would you have expected? A conductive hearing loss, okay? Not a sensory neural hearing loss. So um, this uh, doctor could have confirmed that this patient, in fact, had a sensory neural hearing loss. Uh, instead, a review was arranged two weeks later, and unfortunately, there was no change. Um, his GP then arranged the, uh, sort of did a tuning fork test and arranged an audiogram. And you can see that the hearing was essentially normal on the right, but um, there was a se um, uh, moderate severe hearing loss on the left-hand side. And more so, the speech discrimination was quite poor. So speech discrimination is actually more important than the hearing test itself because it tells you how much the patient actually will understand. And with 50% of the words understood on a test, that means there's a lot of distortion happening. So even if you turn that up with the hearing aid, uh, you, you just turn the distortion up. This patient went on to have a two-week course of prednisone. I personally start at 40 milligrams and do it for 10 days, uh, but some t uh, people start at uh, 60 milligrams and have a reducing course over two weeks. Um, uh, uh, ENT referral, uh, uh, referral was, um, uh, uh, was done, uh, MRI scan was normal, and unfortunately the hearing never came back. This patient went to have an audiogram, well, had a, have a hearing uh, uh, sort of aid assessment, but uh, elected not to go forward. But what might the patient want to know? What, what might you want to know? So it's a diagnosis of exclusion. If you have idiopathic sense, sudden sensory neural hearing loss, it's rare. It's even rarer that the patient has bilateral hearing loss. Um, if it's bilateral, uh, consider systemic illness, uh, maybe a functional problem. Um, we think it's vascular or viral, we don't know. Uh, and the most important thing is to exclude a CP angle lesion, and that's where the referral to the EMT service comes in. Uh, tell the patient that most of the time it improves, but in the third, it will not. Um, there are some negative predictors, uh, younger age, older age, with their associated factors, vertigo, contralateral hearing loss, um, and um, if there's a sudden hearing loss uh, in the other, uh, if there's a sudden hearing loss, it doesn't mean that the other side is going to get one. I get a lot of patients who are just in fear that something will happen to the other side. I tell them it's just as likely to happen to them as it is uh, to happen to me, and I've got normal hearing, I think. And um, I, I sort of encourage them, if there's early recovery, it's a good prognosis. So um, I ask them all to have an audiology review. Many of them elect not to. Uh, hearing aids uh, do work, unfortunately are not funded publicly and are quite expensive, but uh, worth a trial. Uh, there are lots of assistive devices, microphones you could put on the table that communicate with the hearing aid. Um, and if you have a profound sensory hearing loss, severe profound hearing loss, a cochlear implant can work even in single-sided deafness, but again, that is not funded. It's funded for bilateral deafness, but not for single-sided deafness. So take home messages, um, sort of be aware that the patient might not present with, uh, as, uh, with hearing loss. Uh, consider a sudden sensory neural hearing loss in these patients. Remember the red flags. Perform a clinical test of hearing and tuning fork testing. Then arrange an audiogram. Um, treat with prednisone as soon as possible. So don't delay. A few days is fine, but uh, two weeks is probably not appropriate. Um, and refer for ENT to an MRI, uh, for an MRI scan. And if you want to look up some of the clinical tests of hearing and uh, tuning forks, I published that uh, two years ago. And that's all I've got to say. Exactly 10 minutes. All right, thank you.